That's great. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the start of our second season of the Considering China webinar series. And welcome to today's webinar, Caught in the Crossfire, 150 Years of Chinese Students at the Nexus of the Sino-US Relations. My name is Joan Brzezinski, and I direct the China Center here at the University of Minnesota. And I thank you for joining us today and for your support for the China Center in this webinar series. Your generosity makes programs like this possible. A special thanks to Kaime and Joseph Terry for their generous support of this program. We invite you to help us advance our mission and give to the China Center at the link on the webinar announcement or at our website. At the end of the program, we'll answer your questions that you submit through the Q&A link on the bottom of your screen. If you have technical difficulties, you can certainly chat somebody and we will try to respond. <clears throat> Today, we're delighted to welcome Mr. Eric Fish. Mr. Fish is author of the book, China's Millennials, The Want Generation. From 2007 to 2014, he was based in China where he worked as a journalist for the Economic Observer and contributed to outlets including the Atlantic, Foreign Policy, The Diplomat, and The Telegraph, among others. He is currently researching the U.S.-China relationship and its impact on Chinese international students in U.S. colleges. As many as you, as many, uh, as you may know, um, the University of Minnesota uh, has a long history of welcoming Chinese students to its campuses. The first students arrived in 1914, and since then, more than 10,000 undergraduates, graduates, um, professional and um, non-degree students have had an a educational experience at, at our university. Uh, an important part of our campus and community and academic life, the Chinese students make the, up the largest percentage of our international student population. We are excited to hear about Eric's research into Chinese student experience in the US and his thoughts about future trends in student enrollment. Welcome, Eric. Yes, thank you very much. Wonderful to be here. Um, yeah, so I'll just uh, jump right in and uh, share my screen. Can you guys see that? Hopefully that's on. Yeah, so um, I uh, started researching this topic uh, a few years ago, and it's always kind of the elephant in the room when I tell people I'm researching Chinese international students in the US, like it's interesting that a white American guy is interested in this topic. Um, just to briefly uh, talk about why I got into this, as Joan said, when I lived in China, I wrote this book on Chinese millennials. And at that time, China was still growing by 10, 12% a year economically. And it was just amazing the profound changes that it was going through and how that manifested uh, socially and this, this massive uh, social uh, upheaval, this transformation. And I think anytime something like that happens in the country, it's most uh, interestingly reflected in young people who are coming of age. Uh, so I was talking to a, a lot of young people in China and I started kind of at that time getting interested in young Chinese who were interested in studying abroad. So you have this massive uh, social economic transformation influencing them. And then to add on this extra element of studying abroad, uh, I became uh, interested in how that was influencing young Chinese and how they might uh, in turn influence China uh, in the other direction when they come back. And then uh, late 2014, I moved back to the US. And at that time I was kind of, uh, I was kind of worried that coming back to the US, US would be comparatively boring compared to China. China had just been fascinating and so ever-changing that I was worried uh, the U.S. would be dull by comparison. And then uh, about six months after I came back home, Donald Trump made his famous uh, escalator ride down at Trump Tower to announce he was running for president. Uh, and I kind of really, uh, it was his success going forward was really something that I had not foreseen. And it really kind of drove home uh, how uh, little I understood my own country. Um, and I kind of had reverse culture shock in a lot of ways after living in China for so long. And I think that that's a common theme when uh, no matter what country you're from or what, what country you're living in, that's kind of a theme. If you live abroad for so long, you kind of develop this in-between transnational identity where you don't feel completely at place in either country, especially when you first return. Uh, so at that time, I was especially drawn to Chinese students who were coming from China at about the same time as me, and I was really interested to see how they uh, were experiencing uh, this political social upheaval that the United States was going through uh, for a, a lot of different reasons. And when I started looking at the history of Chinese students in the U.S., I thought it was really interesting because you have these 
periods of waxes and wanes in the US-China relationship where at times they pull close together and both sides are excited to have Chinese students come study uh, in the United States, but then political winds shift uh, in both countries and they kind of get pulled. That bridge that they're supposed to be in the middle gets pulled apart and they're really on the front lines and vulnerable in a lot of ways to the uh, wanes in the US-China relationship. And I think we're uh, at a crossroads uh, in that regard right now. Uh, a lot of things have transformed politically in China the last few years, uh, and that's definitely true in the United States as well. And I think that we're at kind of a, a inflection point uh, with Chinese students and how they're going to be treated in the U.S. and kind of what their future holds. So I want to talk uh, a bit briefly about the history, and I think you might recognize some themes that uh, ring true today. So to kind of go back to the, to the very beginning of Chinese students in the U.S., this guy in the uh, top corner here, Young Wing, uh, he is credited as the first Chinese student to graduate from an American university, uh, graduated from Yale in 1854. And after that, he kind of became uh, an advocate for Chinese students going to the U.S. He spent a lot of years trying to get receptiveness in the Qing Dynasty government at that time. Uh, for this uh, idea of sending more Chinese students abroad. And in the 1860s, he started to get some receptiveness from reform-minded Qing officials. Uh, by that point, China had gone through the Opium Wars and the Taiping Rebellion, and there was really some recognition that uh, China needed to modernize. It had been pretty much closed off from the world, and the West, uh, like UK, Europe, and the United States had been propelled forward by these industrial revolutions. And if China wanted to catch up, it would have to learn from the West. So there was this plan devised to send 120 young boys to the United States for 15 years, where hopefully they would learn some practical engineering, infrastructure, military skills that then they could bring back to China and help build up uh, its infrastructure, its military to make it stronger. Um, but the leaders were still Although there were some reform-minded leaders, there were still very conservative elements. There was concern about how these boys would be influenced. They very much wanted them to learn the practical skills and not adopt any of the uh, social, political uh, Americanisms. Uh, but uh, so when they left, they kind of got a hero send-off when they left Shanghai Harbor. They were lauded as patriots. They were going to make the sacrifice to go abroad and bring back all these skills to rebuild China. And when they got to the US, they were young enough, they had some, some growing pains, but they adapted uh, pretty well. They were young enough that uh, they adapted to American ways. And this was actually kind of concerning to a lot of the interlocutors uh, in the Chinese educational mission uh, leadership, as it was called. Some of the boys converted to Christianity. A couple of them cut off their long braided queues uh, that were mandated by the Qing government. Uh, they were becoming very individualistic and rebellious. They were supposed to take classes in Chinese and Confucian classics, and they were very rebellious in ways that weren't common uh, back in China. And there was a lot of concern uh, among the leadership. And at the same time, uh, throughout the 1870s, political winds in the US kind of turned. Uh, in the 1860s, the US had been very uh, anxious to have Chinese come over, Chinese laborers during post-Civil War Reconstruction. Um, and there had been treaties with China. It was kind of put on equal footing with the US. Uh, the Berlin Game Treaty uh, in 1868, I think it was, put the countries on equal footing and they had pretty good relations and trade was opening. They agreed to have reciprocal educational access, but then 1873, an economic crisis hit in the US and as often happens with an economic problem that became a, a lot of social and political problems. Uh, these Chinese that were welcomed just a few years earlier all of a sudden became a economic threat to white laborers especially. And as uh, has happened throughout history, opportunistic political leaders jumped on the bandwagon and whipped up anti-Chinese sentiment uh, to bolster their own power. So, the uh, dynamic turned against these young boys uh, in China. Um, so it was becoming very unwelcoming. And then on the Chinese side, uh, conservative elements uh, took charge and they decided this program was no longer worth it. They brought the boys back early. They only went nine years into the plan 15. Um, and compared to the, how they had been sent off with a hero's uh, send off, when they got back to Shanghai, they were heckled. They were treated as quote unquote denationalized traitors. And they were interrogated when they got back. Uh, 
Um, and they were really kept sidelined for many years. Uh, a lot of the conservative developments in the government regarded them as a danger, as uh, having possible bad influence on Chinese society if, since they had become so uh, apparently Americanized. Um, and before they had left on the US side too, they had been really uh, mistreated. They'd been heckled, beaten, um, they had growing uh, anti-Chinese sentiment. So this was kind of the first instance where we see where, where the two countries are coming closer together initially, but then political ones shift and just kind of the rug gets pulled out from underneath uh, Chinese students that are in the US. Um, so this, this lasted for a couple of years, but then uh, eventually there were more foreign incursions into China and Chinese leaders realized, oh, this is a mistake. We do need to have students learn from the US uh, to help build China. Um, so Chinese students were continuing to go independently, but they didn't really have government backing for about 30 years. Uh, and then the Boxer Rebellion happened. So around 1900, um, this group of uh, people called the Boxers in China swept through killing foreign missionaries that were in China, um, killing Chinese Christians, and this band of eight foreign countries invaded China to suppress this movement, including the United States, UK, Japan, a few other countries. Um, and in response to this, uh, after these countries invaded China, uh, they made China basically again to China's head to pay indemnities, boxer indemnity. And uh, the US actually, as part of this, ended up being awarded about twice as much money as it had asked for. And there was a lot of pressure within uh, the US and China to return those excess funds somehow. And the proposal was floated to use that money to uh, create a scholarship to bring Chinese students to the US. So this time the Chinese Exclusion Act uh, had been uh, well enforced for a couple of decades and it was renewed in 1902. The relations were pretty bad uh, between China and the US. There were anti-American boycotts happening in China and a lot of American merchants were nervous about what this meant for the future. So the US wanted to start to bring uh, these students over and there were kind of whispers of political uh, dissatisfaction within China. So the US hoped to do a couple of things in bringing Chinese students over. Uh, they hoped to influence Chinese politically. And I, I forgot to mention this with the first wave, uh, the Chinese educational mission. That was sort of a goal too, uh, where they, the US side had wanted to influence these young Chinese. Uh, there was a lot of people wanting to make them Christian, send them back into China, spread Christianity. But at this point, uh, some on the US side were really hoping to uh, use education of Chinese students as a way to be sort of missionary for American values and democracy. and Famously, the president of the University of Illinois tried to persuade Roosevelt of this plan to create scholarships by saying, uh, we should be uh, controlling the development of China through the spiritual and intellectual domination of its leaders. Uh, so there's really a lot of hope that uh, we could push China in a more pro-American, pro-democratic uh, uh, direction through these students. So it wasn't completely an altruistic um, initiative. So 1909, this program starts, uh, Chinese students start coming on the Boxer Indemnity Scholarship. And it wasn't like a massive wave. Uh, the first year, there was only 47 students who came uh, within a decade uh, that had gone to about 1600. Uh, so these weren't massive numbers, uh, like you think of the number of Chinese students in the US today, but it was it was more than that first wave of 120 students. So uh, this wave uh, did have an effect, uh, a greater effect than the first wave did. Um, in 1912, the Republic of China was established and the two millennia long uh, Chinese imperial form of government fell. And there was really a lot of optimism on the US side that China is going to become a republic, it's going to democratize. So especially some anxiousness on the US side to influence these students. And to give it a local angle, like Joan mentioned, this is the first time that Chinese students came to the University of Minnesota in 1914. And just a little aside here, I thought this was interesting. So if you look at the first 100 years that Chinese students came to the US, uh, about 14,000 known degrees awarded across 366 universities. The University of Minnesota was right up there. Uh, 366 in the top 10 universities that hosted Chinese students. And Again, in, in uh, the broad scope of things, that doesn't seem like a lot. I think you probably have about 10 times that number there just right now uh, compared to 366 over about 100 years. But I mean, it was 
it was up there with uh, some of the top universities hosting Chinese. So it did play a significant role, I think, in this time in educating uh, Chinese students coming over. So this 40 year period, 1909 to 1949, you start to see uh, some similar themes where there's high expectations on both sides, on the US and China side. Um, and there is some influence, but then uh, expectations fail to deliver. Um, so there, there were some real political influence, most notably the new culture movement and the May 4th movement, uh, the 19 teens, around 1915 to 1920, uh, where there was some overseas students who had studied in the US bringing ideologies from the US. And there was like these concepts, of Mr. Science, and Mr. Democracy being what China needs to modernize. And then this culminated in the May 4th movement, this uh, patriotic movement. Uh, protesting Chinese leaders who had stood by while uh, the Western powers handed Shandong uh, Peninsula to Japan rather than back to China uh, under the terms of the Treaty of Versailles that ended World War I. Um, so there were some, some political influences that started a lot of interrogation domestically in China about Chinese culture, about Chinese society and politics. Um, and I think there are some specific students that had a big impact that studied in the US. But there was also some disillusionment around this time. So, of course, this uh, giving Shandong kind of represented this betrayal from these Western powers. Um, a lot of students had looked at afar, looked at the United States from afar, regarding it as this very advanced, uh, well-developed country that was admirable. And then this sort of showed the betrayal, um, kind of knocked down the U.S. and other Western countries uh, down a notch uh, after this. Then 1929, the stock market crashed, the Great Depression. A lot of students that were here were becoming a little bit disillusioned, really saw the drawbacks of American capitalism up close. So whereas they might've had romanticized visions from afar, to see more of the nuances of it. And interestingly, some students that were in the US, the Communist Party in China was uh, growing at this time. And some students that were studying the US actually became more drawn to the communist cause because of what was happening in the US. Then the Chinese Exclusion Act was still in effect, and a lot of students that came just experienced some terrible racism, discrimination, um, heckles. There's all sorts of accounts from students at this time uh, meeting very uh, tough uh, entry barriers trying to come into the U.S. Um, but it's actually kind of ironic. Uh, the Chinese Exclusion Act, as bad as it was, it, it should not have impacted students. So it's kind of ironic when you hear proposals today in the U.S. to ban all Chinese students from coming kind of compared to the Chinese Exclusion Act. The Chinese Exclusion Act actually should not have applied to students. At the same time, the U.S. was engaging in very harsh discrimination, both legally and socially at the grassroots level against Chinese. Uh, the door was kind of thrown open to uh, Chinese students uh, by the letter of the law, but uh, on the ground, they definitely did still have uh, effects from that. And it, it kind of went both ways as well. A, a lot of students, they came to the US, they got these very advanced skills. Uh, they regarded themselves as very cosmopolitan, but then when they went back to China, there wasn't always uh, a position for them. They didn't always have a place that knew what to do with their skills. So, uh, there was reportedly uh, 1910s, 20s, pretty high degree of unemployment uh, of uh, students who had studied abroad. So there was a lot of disillusionment when they went back the other way to China. Uh, and there were some accounts that uh, Chinese students that came to the US got disillusioned when they went to the US, started romanticizing China uh, from afar in contrast and went back to China and kind of got uh, pulled back to reality as well. And it was also difficult for these students to have much of a political impact when they went back home to China. Um, some did, some did uh, get roles in government, became ambassadors, became influential in various industries. Uh, so this uh, wave of Chinese students, uh, as I, I'm calling it, did have some big impact. But if you look at what was happening politically in China, 1912, it became a republic, uh, but that pretty quickly fractured with uh, Yuan Shikai. Uh, kind of took over and tried to reestablish uh, the imperial order with himself as emperor. Uh, and then when he died, China descended into uh, the warlord era, as it's called, where all sorts of different powers were jockeying for power. It was very chaotic. And Chiang Kai-shek uh, asserted control, but it was very authoritarian, very nationalistic. So any students that had kind of come back with a liberal 
democratic oriented ideology really didn't have much room to operate at this time. And then of course there was the Japanese invasion in 1937 and it was all hands on deck to resist that at this time. So uh, kind of hopes uh, on the US side that these students would go back and have a major political uh, impact uh, kind of proved for not. And in fact, a lot of students that came during this time were a bit disillusioned by their time in the US. And then the door uh, slammed shut again, unfortunately, just like the first wave had uh, in 1882, the door on the second wave uh, shut completely pretty much in 1949 when the Communist Party took power um, and things went pretty quickly south uh, in both sides. So the day that China became communist in a lot of Americans' eyes, the few thousand Chinese students that remained in the United States became communists uh, in their eyes. And, all of a sudden these students, many of whom were very wary of the communist takeover themselves, were viewed very suspiciously. And then that of course really kicked into higher gear when China entered the Korean War in 1950. Um, and at this time, the US actually was worried that these students would take skills back to China and help the Chinese army against the US. So uh, they stopped a lot of Chinese students from leaving that wanted to. Um, and while they were here, the FBI investigated a lot of Chinese students, a lot of discrimination, a lot of harassment. It was the Red Scare, the McCarthyist era. It was not a very good time to be a Chinese student uh, in the United States. Uh, but after the Korean War, um, most of those Chinese students were allowed to go back uh, if they wanted to. And as badly as they had been treated in the US, uh, it actually could be much, much worse for a lot of those that did return to China. So a lot of these students actually got back just in time for the 100 flowers movement where Mao invited society to let 100 schools of thought contend and invited the public to air their thoughts, air their criticisms of the Communist Party. And a lot of people went much further than Mao had anticipated and even called for the overthrow of the Communist Party, the end of the communist system. So. He in turn kind of did a 180 and launched the anti-rightist movement and cracked down on a lot of people who had taken him at his word and voiced their criticism. And that included a lot of students who had studied abroad. And if you had been in the United States, you were especially vulnerable to some of these crackdowns. And then of course, it got much worse during the Cultural Revolution in the 1960s where you had people who had studied in the US, their American diplomas were actually used as evidence against them that they were capitalist rotors, American running dogs, and you had these overseas students who come back expecting to help build China up, but instead they were persecuted, often beaten, imprisoned, even executed uh, in some cases, and definitely not really put in much position uh, of influence uh, by and large. Uh, so this was a very dark time uh, in US-China relations, probably the worst point for Chinese students. Um, so, yeah, so the door slammed shut like again, the second wave came to an end, but as they tend to do, political winds would shift once again. And then Deng Xiaoping, when he came to power, he was very reform oriented and he was very gung ho on the idea of sending students abroad again uh, to again, try to modernize China. There had been a lot of failed starts. And at this point, Deng was um, pushing reform. China was starting to slowly embrace capitalism. Uh, U.S. and China restored relations in 1878, sort of the educational and trade exchanges began. And yeah, the, the agreement was made to send, start sending thousands of students to the U.S. And again, you had very similar thought patterns on both sides of this. Um, on the U.S. side, we see China is opening up economically. Great. Uh, political for reform will no doubt be close behind. It looks like China might be uh, reforming more liberally, possibly even democratizing. So absolutely, let's get more Chinese students here and hopefully have an influence on them. And on the Chinese side, uh, again, uh, they, the Chinese leadership, although they were embracing reforms, were still very conservative uh, by, by today's standards. And there was fear that uh, students would learn more than just practical skills, that they would be influenced ideologically. But in the end, the, the leadership wagered that actually uh, experiencing the depravity of capitalism up close to the US would temper any romanticized images they might've had of the US from afar. But Dung was a pragmatist. He realized that the US might win over some students. And he said, even if 10% of those students who leave don't return, it will still be worthwhile. Um, and then through the 1980s, 
the number of Chinese students starts uh, growing very quickly in the US. So just within a few years, it's by far the largest wave uh, that ha had been experienced. So this was having a, a major impact uh, in a lot of ways. And these students, a lot of them had a very tough time. A lot of them were very unprepared linguistically. The English education had not been great in China. Uh, there was a lot of adjustment issues, but at the same time, a lot of these students, they had just come from the political chaos of the Mao era and had come from very poor conditions. And they go to the U.S., which had a very high degree of personal freedom compared to China at that time, a very high standard of living. So a lot of students were won over and a lot did not want to go back to China. And Deng later had to revise his assessment, saying that even half the overseas students were returned, the remaining half will still help develop the country. And a lot of these students did have a political impact. Of course, 1989, there was the Tiananmen movement, and some of that was fueled by uh, ideologies, things that students have studied in the US, and other countries are sending back into China. Critically, though, I think uh, a lot of that may have come, well, a lot of the student leaders were not students who studied abroad. I think there were some vague ideas, vague notions of uh, what life was like abroad trickling in, often exaggerated um, among students. So. I think a lot of the student leaders uh, didn't necessarily understand all the nuances of, of life abroad, and that kind of uh, led to some romanticization uh, of the United States again from afar. But yeah, you know, the, the Tiananmen movement I think is one one way in some ways that there was some U.S. influence. But then after the Tiananmen movement in the '90s, um, there was like after the Tiananmen movement, especially a lot of students wanted to study in the US, a lot wanted to get out of China, but then against everybody's expectations, China marched ahead with reforms and economic growth just exploded. So in the 1990s, China really started privatizing its economy, started integrating more with the world economy, especially in the 2000s, and you just see a pretty much vertical line in economic growth. Um, I'm sure you've seen pictures like this, Shanghai in the span of just 20 years went from basically a lot of farmland in Pudong, this incredible skyline. Um, and so the, uh, the admiration that a lot of Chinese students had of the US in the 1980s, that was kind of starting to ebb, uh, starting in the 1990s, China was really catching up quickly uh, and developing economically and people were living much richer, much freer lives. Personal freedom uh, became much, much greater in the 1990s in China. And during that time, the U.S. kind of had this policy of engagement where we saw China growing economically. There was realization that it wasn't uh, developing politically the way that the United States had maybe hoped it would. But there was a lot of optimism that, OK, we'll engage with China economically and all these people to people exchanges and democratic liberal reform will no doubt be uh, uh, behind uh, and catch up at some point. Uh, but then. Uh, it looked like this, these good relations might be derailed. Uh, by the late 90s, uh, the Cold War had ended, the Soviet Union had collapsed, and um, I said earlier, a lot of times U.S. political leaders need an enemy to focus, uh, to whip up support on the back of, and it was looking like it might be China. Uh, by the 1990s, there was some big incidents. The U.S. bombed China's embassy in Belgrade. U.S. said it was an accident. Chinese side didn't believe that, really tanked relations. And uh, there are a lot of political leaders in the US, mostly Republican, but some Democrat as well, that were really pushing to take a hard line on China. Uh, so it looked like things could get derailed and maybe Chinese students would be caught in the middle of that. But then September 11th happened and all of these kind of hawks that needed an enemy changed their focus to Middle East and US-China relations as kind of a byproduct of that got a reprieve and relations were pretty good at this time. So this is when what I call the fourth wave of Chinese students in the US uh, starts to come to fruition. Um, the third wave that started with reform and opening up 1978 never ended, but I think around 2005 that really got a steroid injection and the number of Chinese students just started to explode in the US. And a couple of reasons for that. 2005, there had been kind of strict uh, visa regulations put in place on students because of September 11th and that started to loosen uh, later on in the 2005, uh, Chinese students got extended visa validity. So it became easier uh, just purely visa wise to come to the US. But that year also the UN had been artificially pegged to the dollar for a long time. 
And then the Chinese government finally let it float freely and it appreciated very quickly uh, to the dollar. So uh, on one hand, the Chinese economy is still growing double digits every year very, very quickly. And then those that renminbi that people have, its value became much greater against the dollar. So very quickly, a lot of Chinese students and their families were able to afford an American education that hadn't been able to just a few years earlier. And then the global financial crisis uh, on the other side, the US uh, universities, public universities especially, are very dependent on tax revenue, on public funding uh, for their budgets, and that just tanked after the global financial crisis. So a lot of universities saw there's a lot of Chinese students wanting to come pay full tuition. That was a very convenient lifeline for a lot of universities at that time. And then during this whole time, there's this study abroad craze unfolding in China where there was a lot of interrogation of China's education system, a lot of dissatisfaction with the Gaokao college entrance exam system. Uh, so it kind of snowballed very quickly domestically where everybody else is sending their kids abroad. I should send my kids abroad too. Uh, there was really uh, a strong focus, like really seeing it as, as something good to study abroad. And then you can just look at the numbers. You can see, yeah, so how it was kind of flat for this period, especially after September 11th, the number of Chinese students even declined a little bit. But then these years, you really start to see precipitous growth where it's 20, 25, 30% growth in Chinese students in the US every year. And that was especially acute for undergraduate students. So it used to be postgraduate Chinese students were the majority, but that pretty quickly got overwhelmed by undergraduates. And during that time, there were a lot of universities that were not necessarily, they were accepting a lot of Chinese students. They were not necessarily uh, keeping up with the programs, with the facilities, with the uh, initiatives, with counseling, international student services and whatnot to accommodate those students, to make sure they succeeded. So there were some growing pains. I I've talked to a lot of administrators at different universities uh, who said this was kind of a tough time. There were a lot of new international students in classrooms and there were a lot of American professors who were not used to different, um, the different educational backgrounds that these students had come from. So, and a, a lot of the narrative at this time put the fault on the Chinese students. But what I hear a lot from college administrators was it's actually a lot of our own professors were unable or unwilling in some circumstances to adapt to their teaching methods uh, for these students. Uh, so it was kind of a rough time and you started to see these headlines around 2010 to 12, 13 uh, in major newspapers that kind of problematized Chinese students. So there were cultural clashes, um, there was narratives about Chinese students cheating their way into the US uh, and they were not able to adapt. And I mean, and there was a lot of, uh, there was a lot of uh, criticism uh, in the US saying oh, all these Chinese students are coming and our universities are accepting them because they need the money and they're not giving uh, American students those seats. And a lot of the Chinese students are cheating their way in. Um, and I mean, there definitely was issues, uh, some issues with cheating. There were definitely some issues with some universities accepting students uh, for maybe not the purest of intentions uh, for money, uh, but, Overall, when you look at the data, these narratives were really kind of overwrought, exaggerated. And I've talked to university administrators and there's been studies to this effect showing that when you compare Chinese students to their American counterparts, actually Chinese students on average have higher SAT scores. They have higher first year retention rates, higher graduation rates uh, at the end. Um, so there are definitely some growing pains or some adjustment issues, but Chinese students uh, overall perform better than their American counterparts and are more likely to graduate. And uh, this idea that Chinese students are taking seats from American students, that was just backwards, uh, really. Uh, the data has also shown that universities that accepted more international and more Chinese students, they were able to admit more American students as well because they were able to subsidize and help these departments uh, have greater funding. Uh, so that narrative was pretty much bunk that Chinese were stealing spots from uh, Americans. But this was kind of the first inkling of a kind of backlash within the U.S. to the huge numbers of Chinese students coming to the U.S. And it was, it was on both sides, too. So again, you get into this idea of double alienation from both countries. 
uh, around this time, 2010 to 1314, uh, there was a lot of talk in China, uh, especially on the internet, was much more freewheeling than it is today. There was a lot of uh, criticism of corruption uh, in the country, and a lot of people saw Chinese overseas students uh, assuming they were children of corrupt officials, they were uh, spoiled fuardai, second generation rich. And uh, there were a couple incidents uh, where Chinese students were killed. Uh, one famous one at USC where two Chinese students were in a secondhand BMW got shot to death. And there was actually some gloating uh, on the internet in China saying they must have deserved it. They're the spoiled overseas students. And this was a very alienating time, I think, for a lot of Chinese students in the US to see like, oh my God, this is how some of our compatriots in China view us. Um, and I've talked to a lot of students who were here at that time and said it was really kind of a punch in the gut uh, to see this vitriol coming from their own uh, country. Uh, so again, this kind of idea of double alienation. And then the next couple of years, some big political events started happening in China. So again, this theme of political winds shifting where they were pretty, relations were relatively good between the US and China in the 1990s and 2000s. Then China, some things start happening politically. I'm not gonna go through all these, but uh, the internet and Weibo especially started taking off. And there was a lot of criticism of the Chinese government, of Chinese officials. There were some incidents, riots in Tibet and Xinjiang. And there were also some things coming from abroad. China discovered there was a CIA spy ring in China from uh, about 2010 to 12 that uh, they unraveled and the Arab Spring happened. And there was a lot of nervousness among Chinese leaders that the US and other Western countries uh, were trying to infiltrate China and perhaps uh, instigate some sort of revolution or instigate uh, anti-communist uh, party thoughts. So it really started to be some uh, worry in China's government. And things started to kind of crack down, especially when Xi came to power. And even before that, you started seeing around 2011, you started seeing this idea of resisting Western ideological infiltration and protecting cultural security in China. Um, and then there were some street protests, most notably the Southern Weekend protest in 2013, sort of this um, free press, free speech movement that developed online and then actually went onto the streets as well. And then uh, you really started to see a crackdown after that within China um, on anybody that voiced any sort of dissent. Uh, so political winds were sh uh, shifting in China and also in the United States at this time. So the US was pretty focused on uh, the Middle East uh, up until the, uh, the financial crisis in 2008, and all of a sudden China starts to enter the national discourse again. And during the 2010 and 12 US election cycles, you start seeing commercials like this blaming China for stealing American jobs and for unfair trade practices, political leaders trying to frame their opponents as soft on China. And Americans, by and large, are starting to have greater anxiety about China. There was a survey at this time showing that the plurality, 46% of Americans, believe China had already replaced or would eventually replace it as the world's leading superpower, which is more than those who believed it would never happen. So a lot of American economic anxiety starts turning into a greater overall anxiety about China. And then Trump was elected in 2016 and just threw a big canister of gas on the fire uh, of China anxiety, he largely campaigned uh, against China, uh, mostly in economic terms, but kind of in an overarching way. And then when he was elected president, he surrounded himself with these advisors, Stephen Miller and Steve Bannon, uh, who very uh, virulently against China in a lot of ways. And Peter Navarro has written all these books about the coming China wars and the threat that it poses. Uh, but Navarro was pretty focused on China in terms of military economic threats. Uh, Stephen Miller and Steve Bannon, some of Trump's top aides at the time, they kind of had a more encompassing uh, view of China, not only as a military economic threat, but also as a cultural threat. They were very hardcore anti-immigration hawks, both illegal and legal. And I think that would kind of come into to view later when uh, Steve Miller apparently at one point uh, suggested to Trump that the U.S. ban all Chinese students. And um, again, that there was speculation that it kind of plays into his overall anti-immigration uh, ideology that just didn't want uh, especially non-European uh, foreign students coming here who might immigrate. But definitely a, a, hu a much harder line on China during Trump's presidency. And this in turn uh, created 
a lot more suspicion in China, whereas before China had kind of worried that the US covertly wanted to cause it to collapse. Some of these guys just pretty much went out and said it directly. So uh, the mutual suspicion uh, kind of went both ways. And it wasn't just in the executive branch. There's a lot of people in Congress who were taking a very hard line on China. And again, these senators uh, have their own unique ideologies like Marco Rubio here. He is very focused on China, security threats, economic wise, that kind of thing. But like Ted Cruz, Josh Hawley, Tom Cotton, they have been very outspoken against China in a lot of ways, uh, have pushed uh, coronavirus conspiracy theories. Tom Cotton has suggested banning all Chinese students uh, from certain majors at different points. Uh, so yeah, there's a lot of, of very hawkish elements uh, in the Congress as well on China. And I think it's very possible one of these men could be the next US president. They're all presumptive, uh, presumptive uh, runner uh, candidates for president. So it'll be interesting to see what happens in a couple of years uh, on this front. So if you look at the last couple of years, there's really been this rapid deterioration of US-China relations, uh, which has uh, affected Chinese students greatly, I think. On the Chinese side, uh, China's growth is slowing and it has an unbalanced economy and shifting demographics, population is aging very quickly. And this idea that China, the Communist Party can maintain support by delivering economic growth, there's a bit of nervousness that that's gonna be able to continue as the economy slows. China also worries for a lot of reasons, uh, some, some paranoia, some that are completely legit, um, but worries about US ideological infiltration and the idea that US is trying to spark the collapse of China or the overthrow of the Communist Party, and also trying to contain it militarily and supporting this idea of national rejuvenation, China's reemergence on the world stage. And on the US side, the US is very anxious about US decline relative to China, but also relative to the rest of the world, to no longer being the world's one unchallenged superpower like it was in the 90s and 2000s. And also fears Chinese economic misconduct, um, undue influence in US politics, society, education, um, and its displacement of US supremacy. And you've seen a lot the last couple of years talk of uh, quote unquote Chinese influence trying to infiltrate universities, uh, government, things like this. There's a lot of worry about China trying to have malign influence in the US. And you can see this manifested in a lot of uh, media outlets and political leaders, just to give you a very small sampling in the last couple of years. So Tucker Carlson, infamous Fox News host, a massive number of Chinese college students, and professors here are actually probably spies for their governments. Laura Ingram, aren't all Chinese nationals who come here, aren't they all vetted in some way, shape or form by the CCP? So why not expel all of them, at least temporarily until China somehow changes its tune? And political leaders, Tom Cotton suggested, why can't we stop allowing hundreds of Chi thousands of Chinese students who come to our universities, some of which are the children of Communist Party officials. So you've seen a lot of comments like this the last couple of years kind of painting Chinese students as conduits of the China threat as possible spies. And this is, again, this is just a small sampling. I've collected uh, examples like this, all sorts of political leaders, all sorts of media outlets, again, mostly on the conservative side of the spectrum, but also uh, there have been liberal newspapers that have run commentaries to this effect, kind of casting suspicion on Chinese students. And you do start to see this show up in greater American public opinion. So there's been a couple of surveys asking Americans, do you see limiting the number of Chinese students in the US. So if you look at this first chart, uh, just less than two years ago, look at the yellow column here, 40% of the American public overall supported limiting the number of Chinese students. Um, much greater numbers of Republicans, but uh, not insignificant share of Democrats as well. But then you start getting into after coronavirus in September of last year, that had jumped to 45% overall. And then just a few months after that, February 2021, a solid majority now of the American public supports limiting Chinese students uh, in some way. So this discourse kind of casting suspicion on China and by extension Chinese students, I think is having an effect on the American public uh, and viewing Chinese students more suspiciously. And looking at Chinese students and their own experience, uh, Purdue University did a couple of surveys. They, they ran a survey of about a thousand Chinese students at the university in 2016, and then repeated that survey two years later uh, to, and kind of gave you a comparison of all that had changed in that time. So they asked students, how have your perceptions of the United States changed since arriving 
And 2016, it was fairly even. 26% said their view had gotten better, 29% said worse. Uh, but just two years later, 2018, that had jumped to 42% says their perception of the U.S. has gotten worse. Again, this is just 2018. I really, uh, really scared to imagine what those numbers look like today if the survey were repeated in 2021. I have to believe that this would have shifted uh, even more uh, to a unfavorable view of the U.S. Another interesting survey that was done recently there was a survey of Chinese first year undergraduates across universities in the US and then compared those to uh, Chinese domestic universities uh, students. And they found that Chinese students who come to the US were on average less nationalistic, more politically liberal, less likely to fully embrace China's current political system and have lower levels of trust in the Chinese government. Uh, so Chinese students studying in the US compared to their counterparts studying domestically in China are more liberal, uh, more democratically inclined on average and more critical of the Chinese government. But that changes quickly when uh, they encounter anti-Chinese discrimination. Uh, when students encounter anti-Chinese discrimination that reduces their belief that political reform is desirable for China and increases support for author authoritarian rule. So I think this is kind of interesting where, again, the US was hoping with this uh, wave of Chinese students that students would adopt American ideology, bring back ideas of democracy to China, pushed in a more pro-American direction. But I think what you see uh, lately, especially with the treatment of Chinese students and the deterioration of relations is for a lot of students, uh, it's going in kind of the opposite way. This is a very complicated phenomenon. Students are very diverse in their beliefs and ideologies and how they're influenced by their time in, their, in the US. But I think these are very important trends to keep in mind. And if you look back at this Purdue survey, more Chinese students are reporting being treated unfairly in their race. Uh, so 2016, only 15% said they had been treated unfairly. That jumped uh, about nine percentage points by 2018. But if you look at those who disagreed, that went up by a full third. Uh, so a lot fewer students now can definitively say they have not been treated unfairly with their race. And true to form, the percentage of students who support China's current political system has jumped a few percentage points. Um, but I think equally interesting here, 48% uh, said China's current political system is the most suitable, but a majority did not say that. They're either neutral or disagree. So I think that's very uh, interesting as well. Uh, a lot of very uh, diverse views on Chinese students uh, in the US. And I'm not gonna go through all this, I'm running low on time, but um, the last couple of years, there's been a lot of uh, very detrimental developments uh, uh, regarding Chinese students, both in the US and in China. Um, just to go through a few, uh, on the Chinese side, there's been some initiatives to kind of uh, rein in uh, Chinese students abroad. Uh, the Communist Party, I think, is a little bit nervous about Chinese students studying abroad and there's been directives leaked uh, and even promoted explicitly uh, calling for uh, different initiatives, embassies and student groups to harness patriotic uh, energy among Chinese students in the US. Um, and this kind of follows on ideal uh, domestically things happening in China's universities wanting to get a uh, more a solid hold on ideological developments of young people. And this, in this picture, this was kind of a famous case, Yang Shuping, this Chinese student that gave a commencement speech a few years ago that was really kind of fawning about her life in America. Um, and she just got completely vilified uh, within China that was really promoted by a lot of state media outlets. Uh, and that was kind of scary for some Chinese students uh, that kind of worried after that, if I speak out uh, on uh, opinions that are kind of negative or critical of China, or the Chinese government's like, will I get backlash in one way or another? But on Trump's side, like I said, he reportedly considered banning all Chinese students. The FBI launched what was called the China Initiative a few years ago, trying to investigate espionage, uh, especially in American universities. A lot of Chinese students have been uh, inexplicably deported by, while trying to reenter the country. And of course, coronavirus hit all kinds of discrimination attacks on uh, Asians and Asian Americans. And then uh, last year, Trump issued this executive order restricting Chinese students from certain universities. Uh, and that has affected uh, thousands at this point, uh, students that uh, study at universities in China that are thought to have some uh, ties with the Chinese military, just getting wholesale arbitrarily rejected for visas. This has really upended the, the plans of a lot of students. Um, and then that, even under Biden, that order remains in place now. So a lot of uh, 
Chinese students are in very uh, uncertain position right now, uh, unsure whether or not they're going to be able to come. So I, I kind of ask, uh, is this the end of an era? Like the first two waves of Chinese students in the U.S. kind of went through similar uh, patterns where a lot of excitement, a lot of hope on both sides, relations were relatively good. Uh, and then just kind of the bridge gets yanked from both sides and you have these bridge students in the middle that are most exposed to the uh, waxes and wanes of the US-China relationship. And I, I talk about the third and fourth wave, really the third wave never ended. It just kind of got a steroid injection, but we're in year about 42 now. Uh, was coronavirus, was this massive rapid deterioration in the two uh, and the relations between the two countries, is this a bookend on this period uh, in one way or another? Um, and I, I don't have a good answer to that question. I don't think that the door is going to slam shut in the way that it did with the first two waves. I don't think either country is going to abruptly halt uh, Chinese students coming to the U.S., although the U.S. side, uh, some political leaders have suggested that. I don't see that as likely. Uh, what I see as more likely is the U.S. continues to lose a little bit of luster. If you look at the growth rate, this was kind of the boom time for Chinese students coming to the U.S. where it was growing by double digit percentages every year. In the last couple of years, it's been uh, about having every year. And that was even before coronavirus, where there's a lot of factors. Uh, China's universities are becoming better. Uh, there are less students that are interested in living in the United States permanently. China has improved just by leaps and bounds economically. Uh, so some students don't want to leave. Some students have been completely put off by politics in the U.S., like during the Trump era, even before coronavirus, don't want to come. But I think the U.S. is still seen by and large as having some of the best universities. There's still a lot of draws to an American education and kind of more pragmatically, if a Chinese student wants to study abroad, um, if they want to go to a competitor country like the UK, Australia, Canada, those countries together only have a few hundred major universities, whereas the United States has more than 4,500. Uh, so they're going to have a hard time if 100,000 Chinese students say want to go to another country, they're going to have a hard time. I don't think those countries can accommodate that many. So uh, I think a lot are going to have to come here just by necessity if they want to study abroad. But again, I think a lot of the pull factors that have been there are going to stay in place. Uh, but what I worry about more is uh, just to show you, like the numbers are already kind of rebounding. If you look at the number of Chinese students uh, in July of this year getting granted visas compared to two years ago before coronavirus, it's almost caught up. Um, some of that might be pent up demand, but it looks like a fair number of Chinese students are still opting to come to the U.S. in spite of all, all the uh, hurdles. But my greater fear is what happens once these Chinese students get here. Are they still going to encounter this? atmosphere of increasing suspicion and discrimination, uh, especially if we get another president like Trump that is very hostile uh, towards China and includes Chinese students in that. Uh, I think a, a wise politician, if they wanted to get tough on China, would really reach out to Chinese students and try to treat them well, try to get as many Chinese students to study and stay here as possible. As studies have showed that helps the US economy, that helps US universities. Uh, but I worry, I mean, what might happen politically in the future, is just uh, the position that these students might find themselves in and possibly encountering greater and greater disillusionment uh, by their time in the U.S. And uh, again, if you look at these waves in history, uh, I think uh, they might give some sort of indication for better or worse. So I think I'm about to my time limit, so I think I will go ahead and wrap up there and open it up to discussion. Well, thank you, Eric. That was really um, fascinating. And I invite everyone who has a question to put it in the Q&A. And we can get started with some questions that have already been floating in there for a little bit. Um, the first one was, how are, were universities selected to host the first Chinese students um, as they came to the University, United States? That's a good question. Uh, I don't know for all the universities, but I know some universities were quite uh, aggressive and courting these Chinese students. Like I said, the University of Illinois president at the very beginning, he was very anxious to have Chinese students come, like it would internationalize the university, especially at that time, you had minuscule numbers of international students. So some were quite excited uh, to host them. So I think some of it came down to how aggressive the university leadership was. 
Some of it was more logistical, like if you're on the East Coast, uh, it was much easier to get these places uh, as opposed to uh, like the middle of the country, but I, not entirely. Like I said, a lot went to like the University of Michigan, a lot went to Minnesota. So I think some of it came down to just who was uh, most interested, most aggressive in hosting them. And some were like, you even see advertisements at that time trying to court Chinese students from universities. And I think that kind of holds true still today as well. Some universities really uh, have been aggressive the last few years and reaching out to Chinese students. And, um, yeah, and I think some of it came down to, which is similar today as it was back then, Chinese students who have a good rewarding experience, they go back and share that with people back home and universities that are good at educating them uh, and giving them a good experience, I think, kind of snowballed and got more and more to apply. Oh, I think too, um, specifically for the first three students that came here, they were interested in mining and the University of Minnesota had a very good reputation in mining. So it's very likely they sought us out. Um, right. But I can't speak specifically to that. Oh, yeah, majors experience. had a major part, like a lot wanted to go to engineering schools. Like I think it depended on the skills that they wanted. But yeah, that's still very true today. Yeah. So uh, another question was, um, do you know the total amount of private American capital invested in China since 1978? I have no idea. <laughs> I, I cannot, cannot tell I'm you not that. Sure. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> sorry. Um, okay. And then uh, do you think the Black Lives Matter movement encourages Chinese students to support minorities in their own um, country? Are they learning from the sort of social unrest that's happened in this country? I've heard, that's a really interesting question. I've talked to students about this. I've heard very different things. Um, some students I've talked to like, yeah, they're not just Black Lives Matter, but just race relations more broadly in the US. I mean, it's something, the dynamic here is very different than it is in China. Um, and I think a lot of students do become more aware of racial issues, racism, things that minorities in China might experience. Um, so yeah, I think a lot do, come away with kind of more sympathetic uh, views towards minorities overall. I have heard students on the other side too that kind of get turned off by, like they say, they call like identity politics and think race is made too big of an issue. Um, so I think it's kind of similar to what you see in America, like with American students, there's a very mm -hmm. wide uh, ideological spectrum. And I, I say this more generally, I've talked to hundreds of Chinese students who studied in the US, there's pretty much any political issue if you try to generalize, you're gonna find a lot of people that are gonna challenge your generalizations. People come with a certain experience, depending on what university they go to, what their experience is like, that can get all jumbled and mismatched in uh, different ways, but I think it's hard to predict, hard to generalize. Um, so um, I think outside of the Trump executive order on um, uh, banning students with ties to military um, facilities in China, is, is there any other government programming that's successfully stopping Chinese students from entering US colleges? I mean, there's before that, like there was suspicion too about Chinese students on government scholarships uh, that has gotten swept up in this uh, executive order as well. But like one of those examples I did in uh, 2019, there were nine ASU undergraduates that were just turned away at the airport told to go back and they were never given a reason and uh, uh, that's happened at a couple of universities with smaller numbers of students. So like, especially in the Trump era, there were all kinds of shenanigans going on, like with the immigration system and at uh, with visa officers and not really sure why some people are being denied. Um, so uh, even, even without the official proclamation, I think there were a lot of students getting rejected for unknown reasons. Um, and then like recently there was a three, uh, reportedly there were three students that were sent back to China because they had pictures of military training on their mobile phones. Of course, if you go to college in China or even high school, middle school, you do mandatory quote unquote military training. It's not really hardcore combat training, but something that all students do. And I don't know if the visa officers are ignorant of that or they were just being spiteful, but yeah, just stuff like this seems to be, be happening and not entirely sure why, you know, a lot of uncertainty. I have one more question. Um, what's the sentiment you're hearing from Chinese uh, nationals about the concern over espionage um, by Chinese students at New York universities? Sentiment among Chinese students? Yeah. Um, I mean, I think there is, uh, yeah, a lot of concern about being profiled and there's been 
a couple of very high profile cases with professors, especially Chinese American professors, Chinese professors where the FBI really overreached um, and is kind of going on a fishing expedition <laughs> trying to find uh, espionage where it's not really happening. And I have talked to students in certain majors that could be regarded as sensitive who just had the FBI show up at their door, ask them questions or at the airport, have their devices searches searched. Uh, so yeah, I think there is a lot of worry among some students uh, about this and are they going to get caught up in this sort of paranoia? And I, I mean, I, not to suggest that there's not espionage happening, it definitely is to some extent, but I think the amounts, like when you look at actual prosecutions, uh, the hype among certain political leaders and in the media is much greater than the actual threat. I think it's a very small number of students involved with this kind of thing, but much, much wider swaths of students are getting ensnared uh, in either direct investigation, uh, visa discrimination, or just kind of racist nationalist suspicion. So yeah, I think that's a problem that's unfortunately not going away, even under Biden, which some had hoped, I think. I'm so sorry, we are at time and a little past actually. And I thank you so much for your um, fascinating look at Chinese students experience in the US. And thanks to everyone for joining our discussion today. If you enjoyed Derek's discussion, I encourage you to check out some of the things he's written um, about this topic. Uh, two articles come to mind, End of an Era, History of Chinese Students in America and Caught in the Crossfire, Chinese Students Abroad and the Battle for Their Arts. Both are on subchina.com, that's supchina.com. So please join us for our next webinar with um, Ms. Fran Liu. She's the director of the University of Minnesota China Center's China, or sorry, Minnesota, University of Minnesota China office. And she's gonna talk about what you don't know about social, Chinese social, me, social media, excuse me. Um, <clears throat> that'll be on Wednesday, October 13th at 4 p.m. A little bit change of time, but we have a time zone, a couple of time zones to cross. So I hope you'll see you, see you on Wednesday, October 13th at 4 p.m. Thanks everybody, have a great day. <laughs>